والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Surely all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and the controller of the universe and all within and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger his family, his companions and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear, this wonderful opportunity that we have will have gone by. But as we fast, brothers and sisters, in fact, as we do everything as Muslims, we must be conscious of the fact that all the ibadat in Islam have two components. There is a, an outward dimension and there is an inward dimension. The outward dimension is the physical format of the ibadah. So for example, salah has a physical format. All right, there is takbiratul ihram, there is qiyam, there is ruku, there is sujood. So that's the outward format physical format of the ibadah. That is important. But at the same time, the inner dimension or the spiritual dimension, the inner format is also important. And this is the sort of unique nature of the ibadah in Islam. <coughs> that it's not just one without the other. It's not the inner or the, the, the spiritual dimension without the physical format. So a person just can, you know, meditate however they feel like and they think that this is acceptable to God Almighty. The physical format is important. Likewise, one cannot focus or should not focus on the physical format and not pay attention to the spiritual dimension. So we all know very well that despite how perfectly one may perform the qiyam and the ruku and the sujood in salah, if there is no khushur, which is the spiritual dimension, the inner component of the prayer, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, concentrating on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the prayer is not valid in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepting it. Of course, you and I will not know whether a person has the inner dimension or not. But the point is, every ibadah in Islam comprises of these two components, the physical as well as the spiritual or the inner dimension. And fasting is no different. Fasting is no different. It has a physical format, which is abstaining from food, drink, and for people who are married, sexual activity from dawn until sunset. This is important, but we must remember that fasting is not just about staying away from food and drink. It's more than that. The higher objective of fasting, which includes abstaining from food and drink and sexual activity is to train the individual to avoid sins and to do good things. So if a person is fasting, avoiding the food and drink, but they're still engaged in, in, in evil practices and behavior, then that will negate the validity or the blessings of the fasting. In fact, in a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ puts it over very beautifully. That if the person does not pay attention to the inner dimension of the siyam, of the fasting, the spiritual aspect, that is, of trying to avoid sins as much as possible, and at the same time trying to do as much good as, person, as a person can do, then all the person is really doing is engaged in an, in an exercise of star, starvation and deprivation. He said, alayhi salatu wassalam, man lam yada' qawla al-zuri wal amala bihi falaysa lillahi hajatun fi an yada'a ta'amahu wa sharaba. Whoever does not give up qawla al-zuri. Now this term qawla al-zuri is often used to mean specifically lying, lying, telling lies. But in this context, it is more general. Qawl zur here refers to any speech that is non-beneficial, anything that is vain, 
that does not benefit the fans. So whoever does not give up qawl azur, you know, useless talk, wal amal bihi, and acting or behaving in an unbecoming manner. In other words, whoever does not give up evil, sinful behavior, and acting or behaving in a sinful manner and behavior, then Allah has no need for him to give up his food and drink. Ibn Hajar rahimahullah in commenting on this hadith in his commentary on uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, he said that what this means is that Allah has no need for the person to give up his or her food or drink. What it means is that the person is, the reward is, is, is voided, it is negated. And all the person is doing by fasting is simply going through this, this exercise of starvation and deprivation. So as we fast, brothers and sisters, we must be conscious of this important aspect of our ibadah, that it comprises of both the physical and the spiritual. One without the other is not valid. Both are necessary, both are important, and we have to keep both at the same time. So I am not trying to overemphasize, per se, the spiritual aspect of fasting and not paying attention to the physical component of it. No, the physical fast is important. The physical fast is important. So what will break the physical fast is eating and drinking or engaging in sexual activity. But as the hadith mentions, even if one does not break the physical fast, but that person did not avoid sins and sinful behavior and behaving in a manner that's unbecoming of a Muslim person, then the reward of the fast is voided. Now, here is an issue that uh, often people ask. And in fact, I remember as a little boy growing up, this was something that was quite common amongst us. So what happens if a person commits a sinful act while fasting? Does it mean that they should now break their fast and eat and drink because the reward is, is voided? No, it does not mean that. It is important to abstain from eating and drinking. The physical fast must be kept. So even if a person engages in some sinful activity, that does not mean that the physical fast is broken. The person still has to keep the fast. Of course, for committing the sin, they need to do tawbah and istighfar. But committing a sin does not mean that your fast is no longer valid, and now you should go and eat and drink. I remember as a little boy growing up, we used to tell one another, right? Uh, you find that somebody is kind of lying, you say to them, you know what, why don't you go eat and drink? Your fast is not valid, it's broken. No, you have to keep the physical fast as well. Now, brothers and sisters, I know all of us are aware of the importance of suhoor to begin the fast. And as the Prophet ﷺ informed us, there, is blessing, there are blessings in suhoor. Among the blessings the scholars have mentioned are, number one, the fact that a person who eats suhoor would have more energy for a longer period of time during the day. If you skip the suhoor altogether, then what happens earlier in the day, you become hungry. As we become hungry, as the physical body becomes hungry, it weakens. When it weakens, we're not able to perform at a, an optimum level. So if you eat suhoor though, especially if you eat it close to the time of Fajr, it gives you more hours of hopefully you know, uh, energetic, uh, energetic activity so that you can do a lot more and be more productive. Number two, they say that also eating suhoor will inevitably result in a person praying Salat al-Fajr on time. You wake up for suhoor and suhoor goes right up until Fajr begins. Inshallah, you pray Salat al-Fajr on time. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ recommended that we eat suhoor closer to Fajr rather than too early in the night. Because if you eat it too early in the night, what will happen is you might feel sleepy and say, well, you know what, I'm going to rest for a little bit before Fajr. And if you do that, chances are you could sleep away. But if you eat your suhoor closer to the time of Fajr, dawn, then you are already awake for suhoor. And when Fajr comes, you pray, so you're not asleep. So it helps a person to, mashallah, be able to pray Salat al-Fajr on time. Number three, 
It also may very well result in a person getting up a little bit earlier to perhaps do some, some, some tahajjud prayers. Because Fajr these days is about 3.46 or 3.47. A person may wake up at 3, right? 45 minutes before. If you're a person who doesn't take much time to eat your suhoor, maybe 10 minutes are enough. Then you have at least about half an hour or 20 minutes. Perhaps you can pray some tahajjud. That is a blessing for the individual. So there are indeed great blessings in suhoor. Now there's one issue about suhoor I would like to draw your attention to, and that is on some calendars, or some timetables for Ramadan, you see in the chart the time of Fajr, the time of dawn. But then there's a little note that you should stop eating 10 minutes before that time. You should stop eating 10 minutes before that time. In the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ, he told the Sahaba, he said, do not let the Adhan of Bilal stop you from eating and drinking. Eat and drink until you hear the Adhan of Ibn Ummi Maktoum. For he does not call the Adhan except when dawn begins. So Bilal radiallahu anhu from the hadith we can understand used to call the Adhan a bit earlier before Fajr time. Perhaps to serve as uh, the community's alarm clock. So if anyone slept away or was busy with, uh, with even praying tahajjud, they will know from his adhan that look, dawn is, is close. So if you intend to fast, and if, of course in Ramadan we have to fast, then you should be doing your suhoor. So he told them, do not let the adhan of Bilal stop you or prevent you from eating and drinking. Because that's not dawn yet, that's early. Eat and drink until you hear the adhan of Ibn Ummi Maktoum. For he does not call the Adhan except at Fajr time. So the hadith is clear in encouraging the Sahaba to eat and drink right up until dawn time. Not to stop 10 minutes or 15 minutes before. Now I know people say, well, you know, just to be on the safe side. But there is no need for that, brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything in, in existence. And as Allah tells us in the Quran, Hal tara fi khalqir rahmani min tafawud. You will not find any inconsistencies or any flaws in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These days, alhamdulillah, we have the knowledge, the scientific knowledge, to be able to precisely calculate the time of dawn every single day. Every single day of the year. And unless, of course, your clock is a faulty clock uh, that really doesn't carry the right time, and usually that's not the case, then you can basically eat right up until that time. In fact, even if your clock were one minute slow, that's not a big deal. That is not a big deal. If you were eating suhoor, and you had a, a mouthful of food chewing, and the time on the clock says 3.46, and according to the chart, 3.46 is done, what do you do? Do you spit out the food? No. You're allowed to finish that morsel of food, that mouthful of food. So when dawn kicks in, it doesn't mean at the very moment you have to cease immediately all uh, eating and drinking. You allow a few seconds to go over that. Uh, so the point is the Prophet ﷺ encouraged the Muslims to eat right up until Fajr time. In fact, this is what the, Allah tells us in the ayah as well. وَقُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْتُ الْأَبْيَدُ مِنَ الْخَيْتِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ الصِّيَامَ إِلَى اللَّهِ Allah says, and eat and drink. How, uh, up until when? Until you can differentiate between the white thread of the day from the black thread of the night, this is dawn. So you eat and drink right up until the time you see the dawn breaking, then you stop eating and drinking. So that 10 minutes before the time of Fajr has no basis in the Sunnah. However, I believe that this comes from a misunderstanding of a hadith regarding uh, fasting and suhoor. There is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari in which uh, some of the companions were asked how much time was there between the time that Suhoor ended and the time that the Prophet ﷺ performed the, the, salat, the Fajr prayer in his masjid. Right? What time do you pray Fajr in this masjid here? Is it up there? Four o'clock? Four o'clock. So how much time is between the time you end Suhoor to the time you pray in the masjid? Ten minutes maybe? Fifteen minutes? Fourteen minutes? Alright, so this was the question. 
How much time was there between the time that you ended suhoor in the time of the Prophet ﷺ to the time that the salah was actually performed in the masjid? And the answer was the time it takes you to recite about 50 <coughs> verses, which is about 10 minutes or so. 50 verses. But remember, the question is not about how early did you stop eating before suhoor. The question is how much time was there between the end of suhoor and the time that the Prophet ﷺ performed Salat al-Fajr in the masjid. 10 minutes roughly. <coughs> and from this we learn also that the Prophet ﷺ, even after Fajr began, the time began, he did not pray right away. He left, he gave like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So that the person who did suhoor in their home, they have time now to come to the masjid for salah. If he had established Salat al-Fajr at the moment dawn begins, then many of the Sahaba will either arrive late at the masjid for the salah or they will miss the prayer by the time they get there. So he would allow 10 minutes or so after dawn began, then he prayed the prayer so that people have time to come to the masjid, to leave their homes and get to the masjid. So I wanted to uh, draw your attention to this, uh, this point as well. If you have one of these calendars that uh, recommend you finish eating 10 minutes before the, 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 the pleasure time, the dawn time, this has no basis in the sunnah, mashaAllah. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless all of us Amen. and He will open our hearts and minds so that we can understand this wonderful message He has revealed for mankind and that He will inspire us all to live by this message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to perform our ibadat in a manner that is pleasing to Him based on the traditions and the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to be among those people who strive to revive the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in their lives and in their activities. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us our fasting, our prayers, our du'as, and all our good deeds. May He forgive for us our mistakes and shortcomings. And may He cause us to be among those whom He will set free from the hellfire in this blessed month of Ramadan. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.